Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cockerel Cast. I'm Jason Thompson, current player, uh, current um, Northern player, excuse me, and I'm joined as usual by co-host Michael Maudsley. How are you, Michael? Yeah, I'm good, thank you very much. How are you? Very well, Tat. And joining both of us for episode seven is a very special guest, our first true Northerner in exile. Uh, sorry, Ben, but moving to the borders doesn't really count. Um, although only a Northerner in the flesh for around two seasons, we've rarely come across someone who has taken to Northern like a duck to water during his brief stint in the capital. He found his true spiritual home in the bunker. As fond of a hidden spin as he was of a naked bar, and often comes dressed as a Russian spy. He comes to us from somewhere in the Austrian trill, hiding from Interpol for sordid pursuits, is Jeremy Dabrowski. Welcome, Jez. How are you this evening? Very good, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Uh, so thank you firstly, for coming on. Firstly, what have you got to drink with us this evening? Um, so I have a, a local Austrian brew called Puntigama, which is, uh, as you remember, my taste in beer is not one of the more classy or expensive ones. Um, I couldn't quite get tenants over here, so I've had to, I've had to sacrifice my usual quality for this. <laughs> and I am then chasing that with a lovely Isla whiskey Ardberg, uh, an Udegal, Ugedal. What's that? It's just the, uh, it's called, uh, that's the name of this particular Ardberg whiskey. Oh, uh, <clears throat> no, so it was in German you were speaking, it was, uh, it was Gallic. Um, yeah, so Ugedal, I don't know, you, it's, it's all very well, strangely spelt, but I'm doing what I can. Well done. Excellent. Uh, I'm not as well versed in my Austrian whiskies, but the closest I could get was a wee Moretti and Michael, so. Yeah. Uh, I've got a Camden Hills Lager uh, in a Coca-Cola can, which is relatively inoffensive. Um, in terms of it, obviously you moved to Austria about uh, six, no, more than six months ago, Jeremy, about a year ago. Um, have you been missing the bunker? I have, yes. It's not, I don't manage to find many places here where the outside looks like somewhere I'd be frightened to be held hostage and have such an enjoyable time inside. Excellent. Well, um, I think this is a good opportunity to, to open in, in the full bunker spirit. So uh, let's maybe take this chance to, to neck a pipe. I believe we all have one ready. We do. Are they? Cheers. Schlangeva. Schlangeva. <laughs> <clears throat> I do actually notice, Jeremy, you're not, uh, as per the brief, wearing anything related to Edinburgh Norvin. Well, I, I left most of my northern gear in a different province because it's mainly winter stuff. But I did bring a more summery outfit. So I managed to, to get my... Uh, to get my tour gear ready, while we might not be in Bratislava, doesn't mean I can't have the same experience from the comfort of my own home. <laughs> quite right, quite right. So, Jeremy, um, update us, I suppose, your lockdown situation, if there is such a thing uh, for you at the minute, how are you manage it? Everything's been all right. So, I am in Vienna and I was quite lucky that lockdown coincided with me beginning an MBA. And that is what I've been doing on most weekends is studying and then doing my classes. And I have also, because I haven't had a, a physical job, turned into a bit of the housekeeper in Vienna. Okay. And as most of you will have heard me mention, I'm not exactly a fan of cleaning my own things. <laughs> having grown up, not really used to, to having to do dishes or make a bed. And so becoming my own servant has been 
um, <laughs> quite an experience. I'm sure. Or, as we call it here, a house frau. Which uh, so? Which one of these um, domestic tasks have you found the most challenging? It's got to be like, things like cleaning the cleaning the sink. I understand. I just assume that like a sink would remain clean because the dishes went down and so it came with it. So it would be a self cleaning system. <laughs> and then the drains become like disgusting and you would have poured burning acid into them it's a it's a new experience excellent and also getting getting a haircut in my own shower while the shower was off was quite a it made me feel positively lithuanian <laughs> uh, no I, 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 I literally had one of the chairs from our dining room table in the shower while I was getting my hair cut. <laughs> uh, oh, looks like that went well for you though. <laughs> um, so Jeremy, we'll, we'll head back then and touch on your backstory. Uh, so tell us, where are you from and how did you end up where you are via, via Edinburgh, obviously? So I am from Botswana and I went to boarding school in South Africa when I was very young. I was about eight years old. And I started playing rugby immediately. And then, I mean, I got to Edinburgh via a few different places. I lived in London, then Australia, back to South Africa, then Botswana. And then I moved to Edinburgh in 2017. And uh, a few years later, I have found myself in Austria's beautiful capital. Very good, and, and what do you do for work then? So I work with my family business. I am a director, and while I'm not there in the flesh, I've been arranging a full rebrand of our company, the Kingsley Group. Okay. Seeing as we've had a shutdown, it seemed like a, a great opportunity to start changing a bunch of things we haven't been able to to change before because we couldn't afford to just close our doors while we rebranded everything we have hmm. fair enough yeah uh, so you talked about in south africa taking up rugby Can you talk us through your 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 rugby experience then your previous clubs and whatnot well my i i still remember my first real introduction to rugby was in 1995 being in southern africa obviously the rugby world cup in south africa was happening and my father was really really excited to have that happening and while i, I wasn't terribly I, I was seven six seven years old wasn't terribly interested in the rugby but every sunday in the newspaper you got these little um, round cardboard discs with players on them and you could bounce them around almost like tiddlywinks okay and that was my initial introduction to rugby from there uh, as I said boarding school at St Andrews in South Africa starting at eight years old I I had initially seen myself as a fullback and I arrived and was informed that I would indeed be playing lucid prop as that was what my body shape allowed <laughs> Okay. Uh, from there, it was I was at the same school for ten years, so 1996 up until 2005, and I played mainly prop up until my last year of school, where I moved to hooker. Then I went to London and I played for Old Altanians in Kent. And I was there before moving clubs to Wimbledon Rugby Club. And after that year, I went to Australia, where I played for a club called Nedlands in Perth, while I was at uni and didn't do any studying. Okay. <laughs> after being kicked out of university in Australia, I went to South Africa and went to a different university 
where I played rugby for Rhodes and also for what was then the Eastern Province Mighty Elephants and is now the EP Kings who are doing such great things in the, the top 14, the Pro 14? Pro 14. <coughs> yeah. Uh, after that, moved to Johannesburg. I played for Wanderers Rugby Club in Johannesburg and I spent most of my time there playing hooker and flank and a couple of uh, about a season and a half at the center that was an interesting one and after that i moved to botswana which was where i played nationally for the 15s and the sevens and i was there up until 2017 and i moved to edinburgh and after a brief stint of not doing anything found a group of reprobates who I ended up enjoying in more ways than one. Very good. Fantastic. Out of interest, Jeremy, how many caps did you get for Botswana? Not a, not a, not a huge amount. Um, I can't tell you the exact amount. It would be around the the ten mark. Mm. Um, we don't. The, the country doesn't play a lot of games every year mm -hmm. and I wasn't available to play as I hadn't lived there for a long time. So I, I played my first game in 2004. So when I was still at school, I played for the national side and I played my last game for them two years ago. And over that span of 13 years, I still only managed a handful of cats. I mean, I would, if it was me, I would technically look at that as being, you know, a 10-year international career rather than just 10 caps. Uh, yeah, well, but that's the way I would spend that. Um, moving on, I know you've, you've touched on your dad briefly, very much there. Um, but one of the questions we're asking people is, um, why rugby? So of all the sports you could have played, um, you know, you're fairly athletic. I'm sure you could have played other things as well. Why rugby? Is it, a, you know, a family influence? Is it? watching on TV and we mentioned the World Cup as well. Um, so why rugby? Well, firstly, my, I, went to, I was fourth, or fourth generation at St Andrews in South Africa. And rugby was a staple there. My father had been there. I had seen his pictures of him of, as a rugby player around our house growing up. And it was the, it was the sport that I was brought up on. I wasn't encouraged towards soccer or cricket uh, or anything like that. Rugby was just what was around when I was in like the peripherals when I was very young. But as soon as I went to boarding school, St. Andrews was a rugby school. And when I arrived, the essentially one of the first things that happened was you were asked what sports you were going to play and what you could naturally do. I did swimming and water polo in the summer. It's very different to horse polo. So you can <laughs> put that, you can put that smug face away. Like I'm just a posh twat. Sorry. <clears throat> <laughs> and because we, we did our schooling quite differently. We had three terms split. Um, as three months in the summer, three months in the winter, and then another three months at the end of the year leading up to Christmas. So we had um, the middle of the year in winter was our rugby season. And we essentially, we played other sports and we were all dual sportsmen at least. But rugby was what drew all of the emotion and drew the crowds, the families, the feelings. Yeah, it was just something that was almost, it was in my blood from the beginning, slightly differently to my father as he played center his whole life and never grew past five foot seven. <laughs> Excellent, so you briefly touched on joining Northern. How and when did you learn about the best club ever? There, there are two, thing, two memories in my mind, and I cannot remember which they were exactly. One was I was at a boys' night at my flat 
very fortuitously, that was arranged by one of Jake Lethem's best friends. And that very heavy evening, Northerns was definitely mentioned. And after a brief chat, I was, I thought it would be a good idea. But then I also heard about Broughton Rugby Club. And I was looking for Broughton on the night I arrived at one at Northerns. But I couldn't find it. And eventually I was walking up East Fetty's Avenue. Yep. <clears throat> I saw some lights and people making a noise. And the first person I saw was Tom Horton. And I knew immediately that it was a rugby club because nowhere else <laughs> would someone of that shape be, be welcomed so readily. <laughs> as soon as I saw someone who was roughly wider than he was tall, but not, but not in the obese and um, ridiculous manner of some Americans, I... I knew I, I'd found a, a rugby team at least. And the rest of that night involved John Lethem shouting at me because I, I was very happy to be there. But the first thing that happened, we were running a very simple drill and I got thrown a normal ball, which I promptly threw in front of me, led down to catch, kicked, and then went chasing after it like Rocky chasing a chicken. Fantastic. Uh, so I, I, I would definitely remember Jeremy as, as certainly one of the most capable players I've, I've played with in, in, in my adult rugby career. Um, he could certainly do a lot more uh, as a forward than, than most of our backs, I should say. Uh, Jeremy, what then do you see as Northern's unique selling point? I believe the unique selling point is just the people who are there. The club provides an atmosphere that is really welcoming. You could be Burns, who's a lawyer, to Michael, who's a reprobate and a government employee, to Paul Holland, who, who's most people wouldn't, have, wouldn't allow into their homes. <laughs> And you end up with a group of people that put aside everything and really are just there to enjoy themselves and one another, regardless of what any preconceived notion could be. You just are who you are when you arrive there. And if you arrive and you're a good person, you'll be fine. If you arrive and you're a bad person, you'll probably leave of your own accord. Right. Well put. I was going <clears> to <throat> ask a quick question. Obviously, you only you only was there for two years, Jeremy. But I wasn't quite aware of your your plethora of clubs behind you. Um, is there one thing that you would maybe change about Northern? Uh, I know you'd said uh, in the warm up for this that you'd been watching a couple of them, so you'll know that the the standard in terms of suggestions has been more prosecco glasses um, and a karaoke machine. Is there anything that you would feel that you could add in here? I'd love to just put a roof over the field. <laughs> you know, you know, I was never, never a fan of the freezing cold, wet weather and the wind. Especially if, if you remember the game, I played wearing leggings and the other team got very wound up about the fact that I, I'd worn a pair of tights underneath my shorts <laughs> tucked into my boots. <laughs> On a, on, a, on, a, on a more serious note, I think the thing I would I would not change, but maybe encourage at Northerns would be to do some activities with maybe kids who are more who are less fortunate and maybe don't have access to the network that those type of clubs provide. And you'll have a lot of kids. Um, I, it's probably more prevalent in Africa. And my father always had a strong leaning towards trying to draw people from different walks of life into rugby because it 
is such a positive way of improving your network, who you associate with, and it provides a lot of opportunities. So I would, that would be the one thing I think Northerns could do. The people at the club are of such a high quality. I believe that they, as a unit, could do more to bring rugby to people that would more have a tendency to lead, lean towards soccer, mm. which can only be a good thing. The fewer soccer players there are, the better. <laughs> and I sadly won't agree on that. It's actually quite funny that you mentioned that tight story. I remember my debut for Northern uh, was away at Falkirk, uh, and I had been bought uh, for my birthday, which was in August. Uh, I think it was the weekend after my birthday, a pair of uh, really nice running tights. And I was like, I'm going to wear these in like a bit of a flash, you know, human being on the pitch. Uh, rocked up to play and was promptly told by the referee that I could not wear those because uh, obviously they, they completely cover your legs. Um, I hadn't brought cycling shorts with me. So uh, and I was still at that kind of immature kind of 22 year old stage where I was like, I can't play without cycling shorts on or some kind of covering. So I took, I think it might have been, I can't remember who drove me there, but whoever it was, I took their car keys and cut my, jeg uh, my jeggings, my leggings uh, off into cycling shorts. So I could play rather than playing commando, which was absolutely mortifying. Uh, and about 50 quid down the drain very fast. I still had them, actually. It's where the shower shorts came from. Because uh, they not only did they look really trampy, but I did wear them in the shower. So just a fact. Um, we'll move on to the next question, because we don't want to hear about me. Um, do you have a favourite, um, I suppose, victory, game, season, tournament? You know, maybe a couple of examples from your time with us um, that you can remember. Um, I have a very memorable one that I never, I can't really forget. I have a feeling I know which one that is as well. Which was the bowl final. Uh -huh. do, you want to, do you want to expand on that a bit more for people? Well, no one has ever accused me of being an overly humble person. And after an injury coming back, and training and everything going just fine and slotting into the starting lineup which at the time was a bold call because I, I hadn't really played very much since breaking my leg and I assumed that that was because of what was assumed my capability would be in a crunch game. I promptly shut the bed. <laughs> I, in the first few minutes, we were camped on the try line and I must have taken three short balls or fly half and scrum off. And then on the third one, the scrawny fly half stripped the ball off me and ran away. And that just started the downward spiral that was that game. And that eventually culminated in a gorgeous pass where I got kicked the ball and sitting at eighth man, I was nice and deep, caught it over my shoulder, got a call from Wilson at fullback and threw a ball about a meter and a half over his head. <laughs> at which case, I don't think I even chased after the ball. I just looked at the ground and sighed at myself. <laughs> I imagine it's I imagine it's the sigh that Kate does every Saturday night when Maudsley comes home. Not for off it. Uh, that performance has actually been described by more than just one person as the worst individual performance they've ever seen for for Norman. Uh, though I think, to your benefit, Jeremy, I may have taken the heat off you in the in the last game that we played before the lockdown, uh, throwing not one but two intercept tries. Um, so, uh, but no, that's obviously memorable for all the wrong reasons. Uh, I have great memories of playing with you, even if you are incredibly frustrating to play as uh, you are to control and corral around a pitch. Uh, you must have some, some fond memories of playing for North. There, there are fond memories. That, that's more just, that is a highlight in my mind, only really because of just, it's when you are about to fall asleep and your brain throws something at you that just makes you feel shame. That one is definitely, that's definitely my, 
my one memory. But the first, I never played against Del Keith in my fir first season at Norman's. So I arrived in the, in the kind of in the, at the end of the summer, we played the season, the season ended. And then the first game against Del Keith, I only played quite late in. And we played at Northerns, I believe. And that was the game where I was wearing my, my leggings. And I didn't have the feeling personally of the rivalry, but the way everyone spoke about it made it seem like it was very much a, a game that we wanted to win. And we went out and we just destroyed them. It was gorgeous. The way everyone played, John Leatham's pulsing vein. I thought he was going to blow a blood vessel in his eye. And we, yeah, we, we, we really just gave them the, the boot and didn't stop the whole game. And one of my favorite memories of that game is in the second half, some people arrived late and they looked incredibly athletic with perfect hair and just very like beautifully built just muscles and strong and they came on and they were just absolute shite <laughs> <laughs> and the moment we the moment i realized that these guys that looked like they should be professional sportsmen were a little bit like drunk babies was just it just lifted everything and the way everyone else reacted to that game and afterwards the what we were just the banter and the chat made that a really special day for me done so off the pitch then do you have a, a favorite northern night out or event that we've hosted I love Halloween. I have enjoyed, I, I only went to two Halloween parties and both of them, we absolutely shot the lights out. Going as Captain America to my first one and spending the entire night trying to dig flour out of my eyes because we were trying to pick up gunny bears on some sort of obstacle course that were covered in flour. <laughs> was excellent and then the last Halloween I I got best dressed because I came as Ariel the mermaid was a was a great one and I had Dom on his on his hands and knees while I had a foot on top of him and I downed a pint I do I do remember that actually that was one of the more disturbing costumes I've seen. Uh, did you not share best dress with Paul that night? I don't believe so. Hmm. I, I definitely remember a lot of very tight sequins and... There were very many tight sequins and a beautiful purple shell bra that encompassed this area where this World Cup champion logo would be. <laughs> I don't know if you guys. I don't know if you guys know that South Africa won the World Cup very recently. Maybe Just, noticed. Okay. We don't actually have any any Saffers left who mentioned it, really. So, um. I I I find that a bit sad. I think the this the Southern Hemisphere element always gave Northerns a little bit of a boost. There's still people from the Southern Hemisphere, just no South Africans anymore. Um, obviously, Jason alluded to his question there um, about tours. Have you, did you go on tour with Northern? No, and it is one of my most frustrating things. I had to always get, trying to get visas while I was there was a complete nightmare. So I... So I never managed to go on tour. In fact, this tour was going to be the perfect one because Bratislava is about 30 kilometers away from where I live now. Really? And I actually played rugby there this past year. And it 
it's a bit of it's a, <laughs> it looked like the type of place we could have had a lot of fun <laughs> so jeremy you, you played a few different positions for northern but for this question I'll, i'm going to pigeonhole you as a number eight who were your favorite northerners to play alongside you then I mean, I'm going to include uh, two flanks and a scrum half because they they were my my key guys. My my favourite flanks to play next to were always Dom and Connor, so Dom Harrison and Connor Fowler, mainly because I'm not sure if anyone ever noticed this, but I hated going into rucks, <laughs> just avoided it, which is I know a great quality for a loose forward, and. Dom and Connor being so fit just got around and did all the work that I never wanted to do. So I could just enjoy being a bit flashy and save up my my energy to frustrate Maudsley and throw wild passes and run <laughs> over the ball. And then I I always loved playing with Max Hoani as my scrum off. I felt a real kindred spirit with him as as players and i think a lot of the best games i ever played was because he was involved he could throw some really crisp passes from a from a line out onto a flat running ball and it was wonderful yeah exactly for a man who isn't who maybe typically wouldn't uh select himself at scrum half he's a very capable player and and someone i really enjoy talking rugby with you know Absolutely. And someone who took up rugby so late. Well, I'm, I am convinced, you know, he's a Kiwi, so it's in their blood. They tend to just be very good at it once they start playing it. Um, it's quite interesting, actually. Um, I was thinking about this. Now. I was having a thinking about who you, who you played with um, when you were at Northern Jeremy. Um, you recently on social media listed um, a Dream 15 who you'd played with. Um, and I won't lie, a lot of the club are really disappointed to, to notice that you hadn't selected any of us in it, apart from uh, Chris as the coach, uh, which I think in some cases add, added to the injury. Um, why would those two players and, and Max, obviously, not make it into your Dream 15? Well, I, so I played with some... Uh, with a, so Max, for Max, I played with a scrum off at university in South Africa, who ended up being the scrum off and captain of the Eastern Province rugby side. And he was, uh, he was an exceptionally quality player. And that entire lineup was, was not about an emotional 15. It was a purely based on the best technically rugby player I played with in that particular position. So I, I apologize to the Northerners that didn't make that and felt <laughs> aggrieved. But unfortunately, there were just players in each position who were pretty phenomenal. And a lot of them had higher honors. But if I was going to pick a team, I would have a social 15 with. Maybe that would calm a few hurt souls. Yeah, we'll get in there somehow. Uh, so Jeremy then, uh, influences on your rugby career or if you were to look at all the international teams, who would be your ideal back row then? And my main influence as a rugby player wasn't a back rower, seeing as I only went to the back row. It was uh, Jeremy Paul the old Australian hooker. He was the first time I saw a, a, a front rower who didn't weigh 120 kilograms. And his main attribute was that he was so fit and such a skillful player. And then later on, the skulk Brits, and he needs no introduction. But in the back row, my, my ideal flanks would have to be Olivier Magne. Mm -hmm. I always just adored the way he played. Kieran Reed would have been my number eight. And any South African that I know is going to be very angry with me about this. 
but I would put Richie McCall on the other flank. So no South Africans in my back row, unfortunately. <laughs> mm. Which is probably quite controversial. But I, I'll always remember Olivia Munya in the 1999 Rugby World Cup. And Kieran Reid and McCall were just outrageous. They are totally different level. Jason, I don't know what you think about that back row, obviously, being a back row. Oh, yeah, definitely players I, I admire. And yeah, man, I remember having a picture of him. Uh, it's actually an RV study back at home. Uh, I have loads of Neil Back and McCall, uh, all those sorts of players. Now they were, I think, a lot of quality players around that time. I actually would say now probably isn't a great vintage. I must admit, uh, for back row. I think you could argue, though, <clears throat> and this is probably more of a rugby conversation that the back row has evolved from the the nineties. And even the early noughties, it's very much you're kind of you no longer have your outright sixes, your outright sevens, your outright eights. They're all six point fives or seven. Well, you don't really get seven point five. You know, they can play two out of the three positions. Like Jeremy himself, obviously. Although I wouldn't have him down as an open side at all, due to a complete lack of work ethic. Um, but I think the the, the back row, that, the back that, that work ethic uh, goes right across the board. It's not only for rugby. <laughs> I'm all about nepotism. <laughs> all about nepotism. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, sorry, uh, I think Jason was... You only go, Jason. No, no, I was just going to introduce our listener questions. Uh, so I think Michael will lead us through these. I will, I will do. So you won't have seen these, Jeremy. Um, so, you know, we, we get, depending on the, the calibre of the guests, we normally get quite a few or very few. So you've got a couple here, uh, some ranging from... Pleasant to uh, a bit strange. Um, so the first one is from at ENRFC underscore president. Um, exactly how long do you have to go without sex to be good enough at FIFA to get invited to live events? I don't think it's the, the sex part. It's how long you have to go unemployed for because in Scotland, if you have an African passport and a Polish surname, no one will hire you. Oh. Fantastic. So, so that was that was roughly uh, a nine hours a day job for a while. Mm. That was nine hours of FIFA a day. Roughly, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Conser a conservative nine hours. A conservative nine hours. Um, excellent. Well, moving on. Uh, Jason, can you pause quickly? Sorry, actually. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for that answer, Jeremy. Um, the next one is from Curious underscore Harper. Um, how many Northerners are part of the Edinburgh bondage scene? How many Northerners apart from? Are, are part of the Edinburgh bondage scene? At least one that I know of. Less than 10. Fantastic. <clears throat> Uh, the next question is from loose underscore tight head. Um, what excuses do you have to explain the wrestling loss to Big E, otherwise known as you and Sterling? I attribute that to being too kind a person. I can't take, I can't bring it out of myself to abuse a tiny child who hasn't hit, yet hit puberty. And I will also uh, attribute that to a, his, the, the odd strength that wiry people have. Excellent. Um, another one here from uh, one of our frequent flyers as such, uh, at Lucis underscore lawyer. Um, what is your best dress to impress outfit? Depends on who I'm trying to impress. Uh, well, there was a four part to this question about when you visit um, when you visit sweaty sex parlors with Callum. So uh, that puts it in context. What would be your best dress to impress outfit at that point? It would have to be Northerners rugby shorts, 
a singlet and a Von Dutch or Ed Hardy trucker cap. That sounds incredibly appealing. With, 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 with those boat shoes that people wear without socks. I think that would be my, my dress to impress outfit. Very good. Uh, and the final one comes from at Pilton Paul, um, who it's not so much a question, but he says he misses you. And have you forgiven him yet? Probably not, because I haven't got vengeance yet, and I am a very vengeance-based person. But as soon as I have my vengeance, which I will, then you'll be forgiven. Fantastic. That's all, that's all from the listeners, Jason. Back over to you. I think we know who that was directed to. Uh, so finally, Jerry, for me, what are you most looking forward to when life returns to normal then? Well, life has semi-returned to normal here already. And last, well, on, on Friday, I went out for a couple of pints and a pizza at a restaurant. So I would say the thing I was most looking forward to was being served by another human being again. <laughs> Which I, I believe is very much on, on, carry, on brand for me. <laughs> what, um, what will you two be looking forward to when lockdown ends? Uh, probably the nursery's open opening for me. Yeah. Um. I. I. Yeah. Probably. Probably the pub reopening. If I'm honest. Um. It's. This has probably been the longest I've ever been in without the Dagda since. Um. I didn't actually go to the Dagda. Um. So yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. I was about to say, has the Dagda had to shut down due to lack of Michael Maudsley's business? Uh, no, no, they haven't shut down. They've just, um, I think they furloughed all the staff and uh, he got various grants from the government. So uh, he's assured me it'll still be there once this is all over, which is a nice um, thing to know. Be, be honest, what was your main priority? Whether your wedding would happen or whether the Dagda would remain open? Uh, the, wed the wedding happening, the wedding happening, that's definitely my priority uh, and has been all along. Uh, Is that especially you're at home and Kate can hear you? Uh, she doesn't watch the, the Cockerel cast, um, so she'll never know. But um, no, I think, I think because the Dagda would be there anyway, uh, the wedding going ahead is more important, uh, is my type well, answer. I will change my answer to, I would like lockdown to end so I can make it to your wedding, Michael. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. It is, it is something I've been looking forward to for many a month. So, uh, so we thank you. Great stuff, boys. So next time on the Cork Road Cast, we'd be speaking to a couple of Cork lads who at different stages have both played for Northern and Highfield RFC. So we'll get your listener questions in for Damien Mullins and Simon Hannon. But for now, Jeremy, thanks for joining us. It's been good to catch up with you and find out how you're doing without us. Stay safe from the authorities, of course, and let us know ahead of your next visit to Edinburgh. Cheers. Thank you, Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming on. Cheers.